Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our second lecture on BC314. This is our second lecture for this week on media and technology in ministry. Thank you for connecting. Trust all of you are doing well, keeping good. All right. So we're going to pick up from where we paused yesterday. I'll, uh, I'll just go ahead and share the uh, PDF. Oh, wait, before I share the PDF. So, Roshan, um, yesterday you had asked a little question on, um, you had asked a question on uh, home podcast uh, equipment. That was a good question. And, you know, I never thought of that because actually I never done it uh, because, uh, you know, all of our recordings are done with the media team. And so, I, I never thought of it, but I, but because you asked the question, I thought it's a useful thing to add to the course content. So I went back and I just, you know, of course, searched online. And so I uh, just put a little PDF together. Um, uh, there's a lot of useful information. Uh, and uh, so uh, let me just share that first. I've, um, I put that PDF. Yeah, so so I just put a one-page thing, you know, together. Um, so uh, and and I found this, you know, this web website that's kind of giving us all the information that we need. So basic podcast equipment. If you're going to start doing a podcast now, I have to confess I have not done this myself because you know we have a team of people who do it, and uh, basically they take out the the audio part of the sermons and all of that, and then they push it to various podcast channels. So, so actually, all of that, all of that is um, a lot of this automated by scripts. So uh, it's not manually done; it just automated the whole thing. So the audio files are automatically pushed into these our podcast channels. Um, so uh, that's why we don't spend time on it. But this is, but it was a very useful question. I thought it's useful to have something uh, that. We could, you know, if somebody wants to do it, they can get started off. So basically, you need a microphone. And so, um, you know, what are the good microphones that you can use? Yeah, we can get that information here. You need a good headphone, a standard headphone headset so that you can hear is good enough. Um, then uh, the software that you use to edit that audio, uh, we've got several options, GarageBand, Audacity, and uh, Adobe Audition. Uh, I, I used to have it also on my computer, but I don't. I don't have it new. But these are, you know, software that you can work with the audio part. Um, and then there are also web-based uh, paid solutions where you can help you do the whole audio thing end to end. So, in somebody, in case somebody wants to do that, um, if you're having multiple, you know, multiple uh, inputs, uh, mics, and so on. Then you could have a small, small mixer, a physical a hardware. So they give you options for that. And in case you're doing a camera recording, they give you options for that. So I thought, you know, I just I just put all the links to this website. So it's very useful. So uh, you can have a look, and uh, you know, and see if that's useful. So um, yeah, so I appreciate you asking the question because I never thought of it before. And uh, it may be something somebody may want to do. And it's a nice thing to do, to, to be able to try it out. Um, and um, now when I've done, uh, we've, you know, again, we've produced radio programs and all of that. Again, the media team handles it. They extract the audio, they put in the fillers, the intro, the outro, and uh, then they com compose the entire audio into, let's say, a 15-minute, broadcast um, uh, audio file and then they send it out and then they put it on the radio and stuff like that so those kinds of things we've done podcasts and radio um, but definitely you can give it a try I know one pastor here in Bangalore he does his podcast now uh, his 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 uh, and he came and he and he I was on one of his podcast is very 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 simple very basic thing 
he had two microphones, simple microphones, uh, connected to a, a small portable, kind of like a two-channel input. And then that's a recorder. That's it. So a recorder that has two channels coming in. That's it. So he held one. I held one. He would ask the questions, and I would answer. And it was just a simple recorder. And he recorded it. And then he puts it out. Of, uh, of course, he'll edit it, and he'll put it out on his website and his podcast channel. So that was a very, very simple one. And um, Portable, so he came to my office and he recorded it there, and it does. It's good enough. Just that you know, after you do the recording, you take the audio file and then you edit it the way you want it. Put some intro music, outro, and any announcements you want. So it was a very simple setup, but it worked. And you know, he's got people listening to his podcast. So that's a you know, that's that's a ministry. That's something you can think of doing, and uh, serve people. Okay, so let's pick up from where we paused. Uh, yesterday, we, we are still in this uh, chapter 14 on digital equipment. We basically went through the audio part yesterday. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, the, the public address system, we went through this. And, uh, you know, after the class, I was just reflecting. And I think the question Elisha asked, yesterday about you know what would a typical you know set up for a 500 uh not people congregation what would it be what would it cost and that was an interesting question i never thought of uh, putting that information together so i probably will work on it uh, but the fact is th there's such a wide range you know depending on what kind of mics you want you can use basic mics you can use high-end mics so when we started out we just used to go with you know, just the basic equipment, just the basic mics and speakers and all of that when we started out. And then slowly over time, uh, we started buying a little better equipment. You know, uh, of course, better equipment means it's, it's a little bit more costly, uh, more expensive. Um, but then you do have the advantage of getting better quality in your sound and uh, people have a better experience. So, but that question from Elisha kind of provoked some thoughts maybe I should put a little list together of uh, what we're actually using and the cost. But the ballpark that I gave was, you know, for kind of a slightly better, maybe not the high end, slightly better equipment. So it's a little bit more expensive. We don't have to start off with $5,000. You can also start off with something simpler, uh, not very heavy, uh, not very expensive equipment, but simple mics and speakers and mixers. Uh, so then the cost would, of course, come down. Yeah. All right, let's get into video production. Uh, we just started this towards the end of the class yesterday. Now, video production is very important because um, today people are expecting that kind of content. Audio is good. If you can have a very engaging podcast, that is really great. Um, uh, there's one very, very famous podcast uh, called the Carrie, Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast. Uh, CNLP, Carry New York Leadership Podcast. Um, so he just, you know, just sim simple. It's conversation between him and he interviews one other Christian leader or one other leader from, sometimes he, he also interviews, not necessarily Christians, but others. But he himself uh, was a pastor and then he, you know, kind of stepped out and started doing other things. So the Kerry Newhoff uh, Leadership Podcast is quite famous. It's taken off very, you know, widely, and it covers a wide range of topics. But then that's an example where a podcast has really made it big. It's really impacting uh, in, in the in the Christian space, Christian leadership space. Uh, so I listen to it from time to time, and he deals with very current issues, current topics. So um, audio has its place, but video. Um, is again something that people look for because it's very engaging, right? You're seeing, hearing a lot of things happening. So having a good video production team is very useful. Uh, and also this then leads us into live streaming, which we will talk uh, right after this. You know, when you want to live stream your Sunday service or your event, uh, it's basically your uh, a lot of the same people are going to be helping you do that. 
But in doing a video production, that's a small thing, like what I said yesterday, just doing a five minute daily devotional. Or if you're doing something larger, maybe you're doing a 20 minute production or you're doing a short film or whatever. Regardless, it follows these three general stages. There is a pre-production stage where you are planning everything. You, you need to have an idea of what you're going to do, uh, and you share that with the your video production team, so then they can do their homework and get everything ready. So you tell them that's what you're going to do. So I shared a simple example of how we do our daily devotional recordings. Things are planned ahead of time. Uh, we let our person know, you know, these are the topics, and he tells us, okay, you're recording. The recording for these three or four weeks, they will be released during this calendar weeks, so you can prepare accordingly. You know, in case example, if it's before Easter or if it's before Christmas, you typically want your messages around that, and he, they will also plan the set and the uh, you know the things around it uh, around that theme or topic. Then comes the production where your actual shoot happens. Um, and uh, they record it, you know, they have multiple cameras, lights, and all that. We'll talk about that. And then the post-production is when they go back and they edit whatever they've captured during the production. They put it together into those five-minute devotionals or whatever they're producing, and they release it. So typically for all of this, uh, this is just a general list of equipments that you will need. Of course, you will need cameras. Now, I just put a simple picture of a camera. It's uh, a video camera or a cinema cinema camera. So basically, you know, uh, what we do is uh, we hire, we rent these cameras. Uh, we, um, and the, the reasons are, so we purchased two cameras quite some time back. But the thing is, you know, it's very difficult to keep up to date with the latest you know, things that come out. You can't keep buying cameras every year or every two years. They're expensive. So we decided to rent the cameras. So when you're renting, you can ask for something that, that is more current, uh, what you can afford, of course, you know, to pay for, for renting. So that's why I'm not, you know, I didn't put on a big list of cameras. But generally, um, we have an old Panasonic high definition video camera. Uh, and then we rent three Sony cameras, Sony FX6. That's what we rent. Uh, we rent them. So the you know the vendor brings it for the event and they take it back. So you just pay for the hours that you use. So that way we don't have to worry about uh, uh, you know uh, you know. If you want to have a better camera, you can ask and rent a better camera. So I, I would share that idea, and if you're interested, you could probably do that instead of trying to buy cameras. You can't because they're expensive and keeping them safe and all of that. So that's what we do. We only we normally rent our cameras. We do have two old ones that we also use. Um, we also uh, we also have a uh, we rent a GoPro camera. Uh, so this one is a smaller camera, which is very useful for uh, action-related things. So this is a camera that, for our Sunday services, we position it close to the drummer. So you know the drummer is sitting on the stage. Uh, he's sitting behind a, um, uh, a, a plexiglass uh, case or uh, covering, and we position a GoPro camera somewhere where he is, so he can pick up his actions, fast movements, um, and it also kind of gives a very close-up shot of what the drummer is doing. Now, uh, uh, a camera person doesn't go and shoot that. It's picked up by this GoPro camera, and I will show you how we feed it. So this is also something, uh, I mean, you can buy it if you want, uh, or you can rent it, and uh, we've been renting it for quite some time, it, because we just use it only on Sundays for that particular use. Other things that you will need, of course, are a tri you know, if you buy cameras, you will buy tripods also, but or you just rent the whole thing. Um, microphones you may need. Uh, uh, we use simple wireless uh, mics, 
for our uh, video production you know so it, it's kind of hidden so people you don't see them walking around with mics or uh, they're not there but they are hidden uh, in their clothing uh, you can have external mics picking up the sound uh, as well now in the early days we used to use what is commonly referred to as a green screen so you, of course you need light and you need uh, this, your set uh, the background uh, now so here's here's a simple technique if you you know if you don't want to spend money on or if you don't have a place where you have, where you can do up your your set that is the background the decor and all that a very simple solution is to shoot with a green screen and we used to do this a lot in the early days when we started our recording that's way back in uh, 2001 I think or uh, surely 2002 we started um, we used to do a lot of our recordings with green screen so basically what happens is uh, you don't need to have a nice background you, you're just standing on the green screen and you're recording uh, this is literally a green cloth kind of a green cloth that's there so what happens is when they are editing the video they can just replace everything that's green with the background what you want you can be you know they can put a background of mountains and everything or rivers or lakes or a church building or whatever background you want so suddenly you're standing in front of you know these mountains beautiful valleys whatever they replace the green screen anything that's green color is replaced with the background and then you are superimposed on it so it looks nice and it doesn't cost any anything it's just done during the video editing part so and this is a technique even you know large studios uh, would use uh, uh, even the uh, news studios where uh, the person is actually standing uh, uh, on a green screen but they you know, they superimpose the green screen with you know whatever you know, maybe some uh, city skyscraper or something so it looks like as of this person is reporting from some tall building somewhere but actually it's just you know he's just standing on a green screen so you can even do that if uh, you know for so other other purposes but anyway so this is a very simple thing and then of course you need some lighting uh, again uh, we most of our lighting we just rent we tell the uh, the vendors to come and bring the lighting and uh, we have purchased uh, some LED lighting because this one is you can keep it and use it as often as you want so basically LED lighting and then behind it you can control you know the brightness the dimness the uh, the warm the yellow light that comes in she can control all of that uh, behind it and it's very useful and it's easy to carry around as well so we, we purchased two of these but then uh, the other lighting we just rent uh, so typically you'll need quite a few of these about at least about three of these you know so you cover make sure there are no shadows coming in anywhere so based on that you adjust the lighting uh, on your subject um, that goes into the video production and then a reflector kit to reflect light onto the subject to eliminate any shadows and so on so those are the kind of things uh, uh, there is uh, uh, something else called known as the, the gimbal which is if you're holding a camera but not necessarily uh, on a tripod in some other place then it kind of shows you is it is it uh, aligned correctly right so uh, uh, it helps you align, make sure your your camera is parallel to the ground and uh, in the right line of sight. Uh, you will need uh, editing software, production software, built, uh, which we mentioned earlier, uh, and the, uh, we, the software that you could use, uh, high quality memory cards because all of this takes up a lot of space, it goes into your memory cards, and uh, battery as well so battery you continuous charge and replace those batteries so these are the kind of things that you would need um, in your video recording doing your video production and you know we've, we've gone through a, a lot of learning process in in doing these things 
there have been all kinds of things happening. Uh, I, I remember those days when I we were doing we were doing green screen recording, and uh, I had a Bible that was had a green cover on it, and uh, we actually recorded. You know, some of our we did some of our recordings that day, and nobody noticed that my Bible had a green cover. And uh, you know, we did all the recordings, and then they, you know, they did what they would do: replace the green screen with the uh, the background. But the Bible cover, because it was green, it was also being replaced with uh, the background. It was, it was like, oh, what do we do with this? And then they had to, and my hand was on the Bible, so part of my hand was also, you know, gone. Uh, so we've had all those mistakes happen uh, doing these things, you know, kind of learning as we worked through these things. I remember once uh, while we were recording, we had recorded several, uh, this was with our daily devotionals, we had, we had recorded several of our devotionals that day, and this memory card, you know, so all is recorded and they have to replace it. So, for, I don't know what, what happened, but one of our people, he erased the memory card. Oh, I was like, okay, there's no way you're going to retrieve that because it's gone. So all those hours of uh, recording is gone. You have to redo the whole thing now. Okay, you have no choice. Just sit down and redo it. So we've you know, had to work through those kinds of problems and then, okay, develop a system, make sure you don't delete your memory cards, you copy it off to your computer, then you bring it back and use it because we keep circulating these cards, you know, during the, if you're doing a recording for several hours during the day, you copy things off your memory card into your computer, then bring it back, use it again. So all those things are to be careful when you are working on this. And of course, here's a little specification for computer that you would typically need. Uh, something that's high-end because you're dealing with a lot of video. Um, so you need a good a good memory, good speed, a lot of storage. Uh, and of course, you can work with Windows or Mac. Mac is usually people prefer Mac, but uh, whatever you can afford, you need a good large size screen for people to see things and work on it and um, uh, so on. So all of these things just put together for your, you know, for your reference. Uh, but definitely, you can consult with people, your vendors, and they'll be able to help you. Okay. Um, any questions? Okay, I'm seeing Christopher's question. You know, why do we put that that uh, legacy glass surrounding it? Yeah. So usually to just block the sound. So you know, the drummer's playing. Uh, on on all of the the instrument the his symbols and all of that he's playing there, so that physical that sound actually is being picked up by the mics. So it's the sound that's picked up by the mics that is then actually used for the auditorium or for the live streaming, all of that that sound. But the fact is, while he's playing, there's also the sound that goes over into the um, the people, the the worship people, the worship team. So you want to block a lot of that from going in or spilling over towards the worship team because they are hearing through their either the stage monitors or the in-ear monitors. That's the sound that they want to pay attention to. Uh, otherwise, the sound coming from the drums sit right next to them can be overpowering uh, and so on. So that plexiglass around it, him, kind of just blocks as much of the sound as possible. And we get to hear only what comes through the PA system, right? and the same sound is controlled for the uh, the people on stage, the worship team. Yeah. So it's just to keep everything in a controlled environment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So how's the graphics for the background? Yeah. So we'll get into that. That's our next step. Um, the graphics and how is it, how that's set up. I'll, I'll share that with you. Okay, any questions on just the video production part? Uh, any thoughts, any questions on that? Okay, 
So now what we're going to do is, so we understand video recording, that is your your recording in a control environment. Now we take that into our live Sunday service, and then we want to do live streaming. Right? That means uh, the, 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 they're still doing um, video production, but it's live streamed. It's uh, and then as part of that, so imagine a Sunday service. Uh, you have uh, things being projected inside the auditorium, which is maybe while the uh, while the music worship team is singing, the lyrics come on the screens, um, or while the preacher is preaching, their presentation comes on the screens. Uh, and now nowadays, you know, we we, we use uh, let's say typically there would be LED screens, so you'll have multiple. LED screens. So that's happening inside the auditorium. And sometimes even, you know, the cameras inside the auditorium, all their, their, their video capture is also shown on the screens. So that's one thing that's in house. But all of that is also being sent out live online for an, uh, for an online audience. So we want to give the online audience uh, an experience that is as good as somebody sitting inside the auditorium, which means they need to have good quality sound. Uh, they need to be able to see uh, either the worship team or the preacher preaching. Uh, it's nice if you can show them shots about the congregation inside. And also to show them what's coming on the screens, meaning the lyrics of the songs or the sermon points, etc. So we want to give that similar experience to those who are online as we do for those inside the auditorium. So what does that configuration look like? Uh, I'll just walk us through this. And again, here, um, uh, okay, so live streaming platforms, I'm sure all of us are familiar. You know, a lot of us use uh, YouTube, you go live on YouTube. And you could go live on other platforms as well. Uh, but I suppose most of us would be going live on YouTube. And now when you're doing your live streams on YouTube, there's also the option for live chat. So you can have people interacting with uh, with your audience on live chat. It, that's a useful thing to do. If you are, uh, uh, you know, you could have your countdowns for your live stream, or if you're premiering, that's also possible. Um, the advantage, of course, is uh, uh, your recording can stay online and people who have missed it while it's live can come and watch the video at a, any later point in time. If you are working with uh, uh, content delivery networks, and they will push it across uh, various other channels as well. So um, uh, it gives you a wider reach. And also, some of them will provide you analytics. So Google, uh, YouTube, for instance, can tell you, you know, how many people were watching live, how many people watch later, what what duration of your video did they actually watch, which countries were they watching from, etc. So that's useful to know. Now, what what does a typical configuration look like, and how is it set up? So basically, um, this is a schematic. For a, for a live stream. So you've got your audio and your video inputs. Uh, and this is a high level. So it comes into a mix mixer. We can use a physical mixer, uh, which uh, we, you know, we, we use a physical, we use one called Black Magic. That's the product that we use. Uh, so audio video mixer switcher. Or you can also use something that's software driven. Uh, a software audio video switcher called, for example, Wirecast. That's a product that you could use, but we use a physical one. And then that is encoded. That means it is put into a format that is ready to be broadcast. Um, for the encoder, again, you've got two options. You can use a software encoder. So you've got a software that's one that's open source. It's called Open Broadcaster Software. Uh, some people can even some people use the commercial one, Pro Presenter Pro, and there's also another option, uh, Resi.io. So you can do a software encoding that is 
uh, let the software do the encoding for you, or you can use a hardware encoder. So a hardware encoder, of course, um, uh, is much faster if you use this, but then it requires a lot of configuration. This is easier to use, a software encoder, but a hard hardware encoder uh, requires configuration for this. And then that, what is encoded, the uh, encoded output, it then goes on out to your platform. So it goes through your router and switch, goes out into the internet. Now, when it goes out into the internet, uh, it I mean, you can, from here, it goes directly into your YouTube channel, for example, or your Facebook channel, or wherever you're streaming on, your streaming platform. Or you can set up your own server, and from there, you can multicast to n number of channels. So example, if we want to simultaneously, this output, I want to simultaneously multicast on mul you know, multiple platforms. I want it to go on YouTube, Facebook, webs my uh, church website, any other channels. Then I can do that. We can do that through by setting up our own server. And then from here, we go out. Now, you can set up your own server, or there are also service providers who do multicast for you. So you can use an online service. Uh, to multicast for you. If you're doing it on a single channel, like YouTube example, then you go straight. Uh, from your encoder, you go straight into YouTube. Done. You're done. But in case you're multicasting, then there's an intermediate step here in order to do that. And then, of course, on the other side, you have your audience. They will connect to wherever you are live on. Okay. So this is a high level of how the whole thing happens. Okay. Your audio video comes in. You've got your mixer here that decides, you know, what uh, we'll explain, you know, which screen to show, etc. Then there's an encoder, and then you can go straight to your broadcast channel, or you can go through uh, uh, another server that will help you multicast and send it out through multiple channels. Um, audio network uh, we've seen it's a similar thing. There's, uh, you know, there's a console that controls what's happening in-house. There's another console that mixes for telecast. So this person will mix the sound that is going to be sent out. So sometimes we get feedback on our, you know, some of our YouTube channels, hey, or our live stream channels, or oh, the audio is not loud enough, this and that. So this person will work on it and adjust it, make it better for those who are listening. This in-house person is doing it for the controlling the sound for people inside the auditorium. Now, what would this configuration look like? Uh, this is part of it. Um, actually, I just want I'll, I'll just shift the PDF. I'll share another PDF with you, which is kind of a little expanded version of this. Um, let me see now. Yeah, this is our current configuration. So let me share this with you. Are you all with me so far? OK. Let me share the current configuration with you. So this is our live stream configuration. Right? So let's uh, try and follow me. Uh, on this diagram. So we have our camera inputs, right? So we have one old Panasonic camera. We've got, uh, most of these are rented. So this is a camera one, camera two, camera three. This is our GoPro that's sitting next to the drummer. Uh, and uh, these cameras will be in various places in the auditorium. So we have uh, one camera uh, that is a wireless one. Which one of these is wireless? OK. Right, it doesn't show it here. But anyway, uh, we'll have one camera that's on the stage. The man is, uh, the person is moving it on stage. You know, he's getting different shots of people on the stage. Uh, there are other cameras that are set up uh, in, you know, inside the auditorium, strategic positions. 
So we've got multiple cameras. Now all of these inputs from the camera are coming into the video switcher. So the video switcher is basically the person handling the video switcher is going to decide. So you've got, you know, you've got video coming in from five different sources in this particular case. Now, some some people will have more than that, more sources and all that. But I'm just giving you what we are doing. So you've got video coming in from five different sources. This video switcher person is going to decide which one of these is actually going to be shown, right? Which input is going to be shown. So he's going to be switching. So one camera can give you a shot of the worship team. Another camera is giving you a shot of maybe the preacher in a close-up, in a straight view. Uh, another camera is giving a shot of the stage from a side view. Another camera may be panning out on the congregation. So this person on the switcher is manually deciding which one of these shots is going to be the one that goes out, you know. So he's switching between these cameras. That's basically his work. So the output of that, the switcher, uh, is this Hyperdeck Studio is recording everything. So we are saving, we are recording uh, uh, the whole video audio that's being sent out. We're recording it. So that's being recorded. And it is also here. He can see what's you know which one he's switching between over here on the smart view, right? So he's decided he's going to look at this, etc. It's also being recorded, and then this um, output is then sent. So here are two. So here's a hardware encoder, and here is a software encoder. So we have both. Um, the reason we have is um, uh, so there was a time when we wanted to use the hardware video encoder, and uh, then we decided to use uh, it. It's less complicated in its setup, so we decided to use uh, the live stream software. So uh, let me back up. When we first started, we started with just using OBS Studio uh, live stream software then we did try out the video hardware video encoder uh, we just found out that you know it's a little bit more complicated you we need the IT team involved in setting it up every each time for each time we do so we said okay we'll keep it as a backup it's easier to train people here on the OBS studio so this is what we use now in addition to the inputs coming in from the video we also have somebody who's doing the presentation, meaning they're controlling the lyrics, they're controlling the um, the graphics, the sermon graphics, etc. So this is also, so this person's, you know, what this person is also doing should also come into the, the, the whole picture, right? So this is usually, uh, what they're showing is usually com comes as an overlay, we call it on the lower third. So what they what this person decides to show, meaning the lyrics, power, sermon points, etc., is overlaid on the video and it goes through the mixer as well. Um, and uh, uh, it 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 appears on the lower third, the lower part of the video. Okay? So that's what this present presenter does so that whatever this person selects is overlaid and all of this is then shown we have two displays we have uh, an LED wall that's in the center of the stage uh, sorry this one is in the center of the stage and then we have two LED walls on the side so all of that is also shown on the main LED wall as, a, as well as on the LED walls on the side, right? So uh, all of that's how, you know, everything kind of, the data flows, the video flows, and um, the everything comes together. So basically we have uh, three laptops. You've got a presenter laptop, you've got a live streaming laptop, and, and you've got a, uh, another laptop here for, um, where the Blackmagic controller software is running. You've got your 
Blackmagic video switcher here. Uh, you've got uh, a, a device that records the video and then you've got your mixer of the uh, output of the um, presenter and what's going out to so we have some mo monitors so that people can see what's happening so this one is on the stage so the person preaching or worship team can also see that uh, they can see what's happening so we have that as well and these are the LED screens which is for the audience and what comes out from here the OBS studio goes on the live stream if there is some problem with this one we do have a backup to switch to a hardware encoder which is not normally used uh, but it's there it's, it's there as a backup but we, we usually use this software to live stream okay so i'll share the schematic with you uh, as well it's in the document but this is kind of an updated one because we've added this additional led panels as well um, okay any questions so far You don't have to memorize this. It's just for you to get, to get an idea. Okay, this is what's happening when uh, we are doing an in-house production plus a live stream production. Uh, this is what's going on. Okay. Um, let me see now. What else do we have here? Um, Sorry. Okay. So that's the software we're using. I've mentioned you know all of these things here. Uh, you can use. Uh, you can look look these up if you, in case you're using. All right. So the last piece, last thought that I want to share is that uh, when you're doing a live stream, uh, you like to you like your stage. Uh, to look nice. Uh, uh, ours is a very simple stage, meaning there's nothing, we don't keep any anything fancy there. Uh, we just like the stage to be clean, so there's not too many wires on the ground, etc. There's a pulpit, and then there's a LED background, uh, so that, you know, we can show the scriptures and uh, the key points of the sermon that comes on it. So, very simple. And the LED background, you know, you can change the colors and the graphics, so it makes it look nice. Um, but some people like to have more elaborate stage decor, stage setup, uh, and uh, I just point you to these links here, where you get a, you can get ideas on different church stage design designs, and also a very important thing is to control the lighting on the stage because if you're showing it on video, you know, you've got to have sufficient light. On the stage, so that uh, uh, what what needs to be visible is visible and clear. And uh, then, of course, there's also uh, the software that controls what comes on the LED graphics. So we use there are different software software packages that are available, so that you decide what's going to come on the LED screen. Uh, we we use uh, Resolume uh, to say, okay, we want this graphic on the LED screens and so that that's what controls that okay so with this uh it's a quick overview of uh digital equipment you know we've, we've looked at different software pieces hardware pieces audio um video and live stream so it kind of gives you an idea of what goes into uh, this part of the ministry, this side of the ministry. Now, you know, the reason I'm talking about this and not having our, you know, <laughs> video people and audio people talk about it because they may talk too technical and then it's of no value because uh, we're not necessarily going to use that information. I think what's enough is to have a high level understanding of uh, what happens, uh, leave all the technical details to uh, the people who need to know it. Uh, but know enough so that you can have a meaningful conversation and uh, and uh, sometimes you know uh, when you're talking to them uh, because you are you're an outsider you're thinking from outside the box it actually helps them 
you know, because they are they are technical people. They're always thinking within their technical space. But when you from outside say, hey, how about this and how about that? You know, it kind of adds value to the whole thought process. So I hope this was useful just to give you enough idea on, you know, what, what goes into uh, the, the, uh, the, the digital side of things. Next week, uh, we will spend time uh, we have two more lessons left. One is on software platforms. So I just basically want to share with the with the class uh, all the various software platforms that we use in church. Uh, uh, what we have tried to do intentionally is to use open source products as far as possible so that we don't pay licensing fees and all of that. So I'll just share with you uh, what we use and you may want to use it for your church and your ministry. And then the last lesson is on data protection. Just talk a little bit on uh, keeping people's data secure, uh, because uh, in your church or in your ministry, you are going. People are going to trust you with their personal information, and in some cases, you know, if they're coming for counseling, uh, your counselors, uh, people who are engaged in counseling, will have a lot more information about their personal lives and so on. Uh, everything must be kept confidential. Uh, are not. Uh, you know, disclosed publicly in any way. So we'll close out with that. So we have, we just have two more lessons and we'll be done with what we want to cover in this course. Any questions? Go ahead, Christopher. Yeah, Pastor, uh, typically how long does it take to set up all this um, in preparation for, uh, for the Sunday service? Yeah. And um, I mean, where is the bulk of the uh, you know, time spent? Uh, I, I guess uh, you know people are know what they are, what they need to set up. So you know that may that may happen quite quickly. But you know, where is the bulk of the time set, uh, used to you know, set it up? And the second thing is you mentioned about the rental. Uh, so um, you had talked about some some other uh, some other costs that you were going to provide some details. So on the rental side. Um, what what kind of costs are involved? Like for example, the LED screens and the cameras and everything you had mentioned. So if you could provide some detail on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the way we work um, is we all the big things uh, we let vendors provide for us. So like we said, you know the LED walls. There's there's one big thing that's on the middle of the stage, and there are two LED walls on the side. Uh, we don't do anything of, with that. Uh, we just tell the vendors, it's your responsibility. You need to come and set it up. You know, So the vendors come and do it. Uh, so that setup may take about four hours, generally speaking. So they, they come the previous evening, like okay, for the Sunday morning service, they would come on a Saturday evening and set it up. Or uh, they would come... Uh, early Sunday morning, uh, so, so four hours is like. But now because they they you know they know what it is and we are storing a lot of our stuff in the premises itself, so I think they're able to actually put it all up together uh, within two and a half hours. But if you know if you if you're, if they're going to ship bring everything in, load it into the premises, and then set it up, it'll take four hours. But because we store everything right there on premise. Uh, they can actually do it within two and a half hours, but it's all done by the vendors. So our people are not, you know, not involved in setting it up. The vendors will come and set it up. The whole stage decor, like uh, decor means, you know, the carpet, the elevation for the worship team. So again, that's all outsourced. A vendor comes in and he sets that up. The 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 thing that our people do is, and also the movement of all our equipment from where it's stored into the auditorium. Uh, we have vendors who come and move it for us. So our people don't have to do that. No. Then once they move it into the premise, then our people, which means mostly volunteers and a few church staff, actually do the setup, meaning the connecting of the cables and everything. Now, because that is, you know, everything of um, all of that is already, or to say, laid out very clearly okay in the green room we know you know these are the equipment that's got to be there in the green room the cabling is all there 
what's on stage is there, what's at the bottom of the stage is there, and what's in the back of the auditorium, all done. So since all of this is well you know, known, uh, that setup basically takes place within two hours. Uh, so people would come in. So we have the 8 o'clock service. So people would generally come in by 6 or sometimes 6.30. Everything is ready. Typically, you know, even by 7.30, they're able to get ready. Uh, some, sometimes the setup happens on Saturday. Right, some of it. Actually, that's how we try to work. We usually try to do a lot of the setup on Saturday evening, so there's no rush on Sunday morning. So they would come, they set up everything, and uh, by 7.30, the worship team runs through a quick practice, 8 o'clock, one service. Then they have a gap between 10 to 10.30, so they would do a you know finer practice during that half an hour, and 10.30, next service. Um, cameras also the same thing. Cameras, uh, windows bring, they will bring it, they will set it up, they hook it in, finished. So um, on most, for most weekends, the setup is done on Saturday evening. Uh, so only if the auditorium is not available for some reason, um, you know, they get delayed. But generally, every Saturday evening, late in the evening, it's all done. So it's Sunday morning, 6.30, 6, 6.30, they come. Uh, final touches are done. 7.30, worship team can practice. Um, rental costs. So uh, again, I, I, I see we have negotiated rates down with all our vendors. They may not be the market rates because market rates would be much higher. Uh, so with all our vendors, what you know, we're saying, look, this is four to five Sundays a month that you're getting work. So they have given us, you know, uh, because and it's throughout the year, it's an ongoing thing. So they've given us very um, reasonable rates. Um, I can give you some numbers, you know, from the top of my head based on what I remember. But maybe what I should do is. Uh, um, just to be a bit, bit more accurate, uh, maybe I'll put it together and I can share it in class next week. Uh, so that'll be a better, you know, a better. I mean, I, I can I remember what we initially had conversations and negotiated, but it's better I go back and uh, get those numbers and you know give you the real numbers as of today. I'll do that for next class, so it gives you an idea. Of, okay, this is the cost that goes into renting all this equipment and per Sunday. So if you, if you give me some time, I'll give it to you next Sunday. All right, any other questions? Fine. So let's wrap up today uh, with closing prayer. Uh, and we'll see if we can finish the course next weekend and next Thursday, um, Thursday and Friday, uh, cover the rest of the content next week. And uh, we may be done. By then, let's see how things go. Could somebody please pray and then we will dismiss. Thank you. Anyone could pray and we'll dismiss. I will pray. Please go ahead, Maggie. Uh, Lord, we thank you, Heavenly Father. We thank you for your wisdom, Lord, and your pro the provision you, you are providing us, Lord, with knowledge, Jesus. So that we we are equipped, we we are prepared, Lord, for your ministry and for the world ahead, Lord. And we pray, Father, that whatever we learn, Lord, we'll, we'll understand it in a way that we, we make this knowledge useful, Lord, and we, we, we make it practical, Lord, for your kingdom, Father. Mm. We pray, Father, that you be with us, Lord, this, this weekend and until we meet again on Monday, Lord. In your mighty name, Father, we pray. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Have a good weekend. See you all next week. 
God bless. Bye now.